Stephen Griffiths became known as the crossbow cannibal in 2010 after the horrific murders of three women, for which he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Shockingly, one of his murders was captured on CCTV, the first time a serial killer has ever been caught killing on camera. But could he have killed more? After his arrest, it was indicating that he had murdered five people. He did tell us that he dismembered all women. He said he'd eaten parts of the first two. My name is David Wilson, and I've spent my entire career studying or working with serious and violent offenders. I'm particularly known for studying serial murderers, and my hypothesis is that serial killers don't emerge fully formed when we first hear about them in the media. They're a long time in the making. So the challenge for me is not to discover when they stopped killing, but to discover when they first started to kill, to see if they can be connected to other unsolved murders. time as professor of criminology at Birmingham City University, I've learned one important lesson. If criminology is to have real meaning, it can't just be discussed in libraries or in lecture theatres, but it has to be reconnected to real crimes and to real people. So I'm going to get out of the university and reconsider some of the most complicated modern cases of serial murder to see if those serial killers have been getting away with murder. Criminology is the scientific study of criminals and their crimes. It's a multidisciplinary field that combines elements of psychology, victimology and anthropology to discover the nature of how and why people commit crimes. I want to use my new theories on crime to look at one of the most disturbing cases I've ever seen, that of Stephen Griffiths, the self-styled crossbow cannibal. In 2010, he was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole for the brutal murders of Susan Rushworth, Shelley Armitage, and Suzanne Blamires in Bradford. Despite his conviction, I'm convinced there are other unsolved murders that could be linked to him with further investigation. A student of criminology, Griffiths was studying serial killers and, unbeknown to anyone, was aspiring to become one himself. I've come to Bradford to find out a little more about Stephen Griffiths, where he lived, and where he murdered three women. And just to my left is Homefield Court, where he had his apartment, which looks out onto Thornton Road. And we're on the edge here of the red light district of Bradford. And the first thing that strikes me is that we're in a place, therefore, where there was another serial killer who attacked and murdered women. And I'm talking, of course, of Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper. And I wonder if Griffiths, the PhD student of homicide studies, was in some way inspired copying the activities of Sutcliffe. Every criminology student would have studied Peter Sutcliffe and his shocking crimes. He's the north of England's most notorious serial killer, whose reign of terror throughout the 1970s and beyond ended in him serving 20 life sentences for 13 murders. Was Griffiths seeking to emulate him? Walking the streets around Griffiths' flat, it wasn't long before I found my first clue that there may be more victims. Brian, you lived opposite Stephen Griffiths, didn't you? Yes, I did, yeah. yeah. Did you see him when he was taken away after being arrested? Yeah, we saw him getting uh, taken away in handcuffs. Did he say anything? How did he react? When they threw him in back at the van, he was shouting, there's a lot more than this. He said there's a lot more than this? Yeah. 
I've been in Bradford for literally 10 minutes, and the first person I meet saw Griffiths being taken away by the police, and Griffiths shouts back, there's more than what you think. So, in relation to my hypothesis that serial killers are often responsible for more murders than they've can been convicted of, I think I've come to the right place. I need to start my investigation by looking in detail at his last known crime, which occurred on the 21st of May, 2010. I'm Graham Weldon. I'm a detective sergeant with the Homicide and Major Inquiry team uh, with the West Yorkshire Police, and I was the lead DS on the Stephen Griffiths case. We received a call that a member of staff at Ownfield Court had been reviewing the CCTV footage from the previous weekend and had come across images that he obviously found quite disturbing. And a couple of officers from the Bradford Vice team were dispatched down there to review uh, exactly what the footage showed. The officers that had reviewed the footage, they described what they effectively thought they'd seen and it became apparent that something quite serious had, 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 had happened. To their amazement, the police discovered CCTV footage from Homefield Court of Stephen Griffiths attacking and killing 36-year-old Suzanne Blamars, a sex worker who had been reported missing just days earlier. This is the first time I have ever actually seen a serial killer committing his crimes. The CCTV footage is invaluable in demonstrating his method of murder. The similarities in the killer's crimes are known as their modus operandi, or mode of operation. In modern crime theory, it's one of the most vital tools we can use to tell us everything about how a killer committed their crimes. It's a criminal signature, providing clues as to whether other crimes have been committed by the same person. I've been able to review the unedited CCTV footage in full to try and answer the question, was he caught after only killing three people, or was he far more practised in the art of killing? And it was in a corridor similar to this, just round the corner, that Stephen Griffiths murdered Suzanne Blamires. And I think it's quite important to explain what I've seen in relation to the kind of serial killer that Stephen Griffiths was. So we'll see Griffiths bring Suzanne into the corridor and walk down the corridor all the way to Griffiths' flat. They'll both enter the flat, the door closes, and then some two minutes later, Suzanne is gonna rush out of the flat and run back down the corridor away from where Griffiths is. Griffiths emerges himself, stands and fires a crossbow bolt at Suzanne, although he misses. But perhaps because she's terrified, she's almost paralyzed with fear. And so Griffiths sprints after her back down the corridor. He grabs hold of her, pushes her to the ground, reloads his crossbow and kills her. And as he's doing so, he realizes for the first time, everything that he just did was caught on camera. He therefore gestures to the camera and holds up his crossbow. This is unique behavior, and I believe that these are the practiced actions of a man who has murdered more than three women. And this idea may be borne out by his first dealings with the police. At his very first police interview, did Griffiths inadvertently reveal the true extent of his killing spree? After his arrest, he was quite clearly wanted to tell us about what he'd done. Clearly at that stage he was indicating that he had murdered five people. In 2010, Stephen Griffiths was arrested after CCTV footage captured him in the act of murdering 36-year-old Suzanne Blamars. I'm investigating whether I might be able to connect him to other unsolved murders. For those who have studied Griffiths' crimes, the biggest question is, did this PhD criminology student 
who aspired to become a serial killer make a fatal mistake in being captured in the act of murder, or did he in fact want to reveal himself to make his crimes more notorious? By re-analyzing this previously undisclosed CCTV footage, I think I've discovered the answer. The videotape is chilling, but also interesting. This is the only video in the world of a serial killer actually killing. I've noticed something that's not been commented on before, and it's this. When he's coming in to the lift with Suzanne, he's not wearing gloves. He goes into his flat, and it's in his flat that he puts gloves on. Why would he be doing that? He was forensically aware enough to not be wearing gloves when he's outside, enters his flat, puts on a pair of gloves because he doesn't want to leave any forensic evidence on Suzanne Blamar's body. He runs out of his flat after her wearing gloves. And then you've got this incredible scene where his fantasy of what a murder was going to be like does not match the reality of how he had planned and calculated that murder to be. When he comes back out of his flat again, he's changed his gloves again. He's not wearing the gloves he was originally wearing when he was chasing after her. He's now wearing fingerless gloves. He makes the gesture to the camera. He did not mean to be caught. If that murder had gone to plan, he would still be killing today. Nothing could have saved Suzanne Blamires from this psychopathic killer. However, victims are often lost behind the gratuitous headlines of the serial killer's crimes, particularly if, like Suzanne, they made their living in the sex industry. But understanding the victims is crucial in building up a profile of a killer, so I've come to meet Suzanne's mother to learn more about her daughter. Nikki, can you describe for me what Suzanne was like as a, a girl growing up? Um, she was just a normal, happy kid, you know. She wanted to be a nurse. What occurred in Suzanne's life to take it in a direction away from nursing? It was her age, mainly. You know, she started going out with friends, clubbing, and I think um, getting into the drugs stemmed from there. Did you discover that she was also selling sexual services around that time? Oh, yeah. I was absolutely devastated. Never affected our, our relationship. Don't, don't worry. Do you know what I mean? You reported her missing, but it was only a few days before... Yeah. ..she was found, wasn't it? I dropped her off home on the morning, anyhow, and she went out at the night and never came back. Are you aware of the circumstances in which Suzanne died? I didn't see any tape, but the police came and obviously they explained to me what happened. Said that they believed she'd come to significant harm. With Griffiths in custody for Suzanne's murder, the story took an unexpected twist. Former Detective Sergeant John Lee is the only police officer to have ever interviewed Griffiths about his crimes. The first time you walked into the interview room was Stephen Griffiths. What sort of impression did you gain of him? It was, it was almost shy, I think. Not a lot of emotion. Why did you feel the need to, to kill her? I don't know. But what he was saying was shocking. What, what, what was he admitting to in well, his he, interviews? He admitted to killing three girls as calmly as somebody admitting to me in my early days of a shoplifting. We were aware there were girls missing. We weren't necessarily aware that the girls had been murdered. Did he admit to those, do you think, because he thought the game was up because of the CCTV? Yeah. 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 Griffiths was initially arrested for only one murder, but police were also investigating two other missing sex workers, although they hadn't yet officially linked the crimes. But in interview, Griffiths admitted in grisly detail what he'd done to his three victims. Did Griffiths offer detail about what he had done to the three women? He did tell us that he dismembered 
all three women, used power tools on some of the girls, and they, then he disposed of all the bodies out of the flat. And if you can't tell us where, what sort of location did you put them? And now, uh, where a robot, where a computer would put them. You know, you know a rational, emotionless aberration would proceed. One of the things that was subsequently reported in the press, of course, was that he was a cannibal, that he'd eaten body parts. Did he talk about cannibalism? He did. He said he'd eaten parts of the first two. Uh, and then on the last girl, he wanted to try eating raw meat because he'd not eaten it before. It was something, a taboo. Wanted to be a, a taboo. cultural taboo. And one of the things he said very early on, he said he was going to talk about five murders in Bradford. Why does he only talk about three? It was calculated, his replies were a bit robotic, like he'd been, and this is only my opinion again, like he'd been thinking about how we might confess at a later stage. And it's interesting that Griffiths admits to three because, of course, that's the commonly accepted number to be labelled as a serial killer. I think he said something similar to, or oh, Robert Black only killed three. With Griffiths mentioning the name of child murderer Robert Black, coupled with his fascination with Peter Sutcliffe and other killers, I'm convinced that this student of murder was modelling himself on convicted serial killers. Like them, I suspect he may have been toying with police, withholding information about the full extent of his crimes, a technique practiced most notoriously by the Moores murderers. Despite his mind games, police didn't have long to wait for physical evidence to link him to the crimes, as just one day after his arrest, they made a shocking discovery. Graham Weldon was the lead DSI tasked with investigating the Griffiths case. Graham, how was Suzanne Blamar's body found? Basically, a local workman who uh, works in one of the local factories spotted a bag in the river. This bag had become entangled on some uh, debris. So he'd gone into uh, the river to investigate and recover this bag to see what was in the bag. In relation to initial findings, then clearly the bag with the head, and when that was examined, embedded within the head was a knife and a crossbow bolt. Clearly the indication being that that was Susan Blairmeyer's. Obviously then we instigated the search of the river and numerous body parts were retrieved from the river. 80 body parts were discovered by police and forensic examination revealed that most belonged to Suzanne Blairmeyer's. But they also found just one vertebra from another missing sex worker called Shelley Armitage. Tonight, huge searches around the flat where Stephen Griffiths lived. Officers on their knees, picking through every inch of ground. The police turned their attention to Griffiths' flat and quickly discovered traces of blood from both victims found in the river air. But they also uncovered evidence of a third victim, 43-year-old Susan Rushworth, who'd been missing for over a year. To date, her body has never been found. When the CCTV from Homefield Court was reanalyzed, they made their final shocking discovery. We found CCTV footage to link him to Shelley Armitage, which again put him in her company. Additionally, he was seen leaving those premises with various bags of various sizes and shapes. Clearly, those bags were being used to transport parts of the body of Susan Blair Myers from his flat out to the river air. His admission of killing two more sex workers couldn't be proved. In December 2010, he was sentenced to life without parole for the three murders. To this day, his early admission of two more killings has never been resolved. Unfortunately, with Griffiths deciding not to speak to us any further, he closed down a avenue that we had to try and identify any other murders of sex workers. To discover if indeed there are two unknown victims, I'll need the help of some of the brightest young criminological minds in the country, my postgraduate students at Birmingham City University. OK, I know that we're discussing today the case of Stephen Griffiths, and I'm aware that he killed three women, 
What's motivating him? Well, I think I'd have to put him under as a hedonistic serial killer. There's something there to do with pushing boundaries, kind of leaving a name for himself, I guess. In the one attack, Shelley Armitage, in 2010, he had her in the bath. He sort of set her up to look provocative. He wrote Sex Slave on her back. I see. The dismembering of a body, cutting it into over 80 parts, these would be behaviours that would be learned over a distinct period of time. If I go back to look at unsolved sex workers, what am I looking for? Sex worker based in Bradford, obviously someone who's working alone. I'll be also be looking at missing persons, not just from Bradford, from all over the country. I think it's quite usual for serial killers to start perhaps their first case of murder in their mid to late 20s, so it's quite likely that there is cases from earlier on in his lifetime. We need to establish if there are actually unsolved murders of sex workers. And so if you, if you can take that on for me, I, I'd be grateful. Whilst my students look into unsolved cold cases, I want to build a picture of the man behind the monster. I need to look deep into his past. Were there any clues to indicate his potential for violent future crimes? Stephen Griffiths was born in 1969 in Batley, West Yorkshire. The eldest of three siblings, he was a shy, quiet child. At age 13, he was sent to the exclusive Queen Elizabeth Grammar School. Notorious at the school was former student, serial killer John George Haig, nicknamed the Acid Bath Murderer, who killed up to nine people during the 1940s. At school, Griffiths would develop a penchant for torturing animals, a trait evident in many serial killers' childhoods. At age 18, he robbed a shop and slashed the shopkeeper's face with a knife, for which he was sentenced to three years in a young offender's institution. Concerned about his state of mind, he was assessed by a psychologist from Rampton Secure Hospital. I've come to meet Dr. Wood, the forensic psychiatrist who assessed Griffiths. His diagnosis was terrifying. How did you first come to meet Stephen Griffiths? He was referred to me when he was just over 17 years of age, when he was in trouble with the police. He'd been arrested, and it was necessary to assess him for a report for the court. But what sort of person did you encounter? It was plain from the start that he was a very troubled young man who was developing a personality disorder when um, he was first referred for assessment. The term I would, I would use is schizoid. A person with a schizoid personality has great difficulty in forming relationships with other people. They often have a, a low or an absent libido. They are self-centered, they feel at odds with the world. People who have difficulty in relating to other people will often fantasize about hurting people, controlling people, which we would call sadistic fantasy. I thought it was likely that he would go on to commit serious offenses. What I couldn't say is when or what type of offenses he would commit. Dr. Wood viewed Griffiths as a potentially dangerous schizoid who had sadistic fantasies as early as 1992, 18 years before the crimes for which he was convicted. Did his murderous career start years earlier, and could there be more potential victims to investigate? I'm attempting to find evidential links between convicted serial killer Stephen Griffiths and other unsolved murders. I've discovered that a psychologist viewed Griffiths as a potentially dangerous schizoid as early as 1992, 18 years before the murders he was convicted of. I now need to investigate whether I can rule him in or out as a potential suspect for any unsolved cold cases that bear similarities to his grisly modus operandi. OK, Sophie, what have you been able to discover about the murders of uh, sex workers which have been unsolved in Bradford? I looked back up until 2001, um, and that came up with a few um, potential unsolved prostitute murders. However, I thought I'd extend it back to 1991. That'll take us back to when Griffiths was around 21. Uh -huh. um, and that pulled out five 
um, potential unsolved prostitute murders in that area. Between 1991 and 2010, there were five unsolved murders of sex workers in the north of England. However, one of the murders took place whilst Griffiths was in prison, and two others do not bear his MO. But there are two on the list that deserve further investigation. Well, I think if we concentrate going forward in relation to Dawn Shields and Rebecca yeah. Hall, that might give us the best way of seeing if this hypothesis that convicted serial killers are usually responsible for other murders than the ones they are convicted of, that might give us the best way of testing that particular hypothesis. The first cold case took place in 1994, just months after Griffiths' release from prison. 19-year-old Don Shields disappeared from Sheffield's red light district in May 1994. Just days later, her body was found in a shallow grave at Mam Tor in Derbyshire's picturesque Peak District. She was a sex worker and had been stripped and suffered violent head injuries, hallmarks of Griffiths' known MO in victim selection. To date, her murder remains unsolved. I've come to meet Peter Hall, the former lead detective involved in the investigation. Peter, thanks for coming up. Can you show me where you found the body? So, Peter, what, what time of year are we talking about? Well, it was May, in the middle of May, spring of 1994. Peter, can you tell me the circumstances in which the body was found? Well, the body was found by a park ranger. It was uh, positioned over in this, this piece of ground here and it had been covered by uh, a, a mound of stones. Was the body clothed or was it naked? Um, the body was naked. This isn't a body that's simply dumped and left. The, the killer has taken time to conceal the body. Would that be your...? That's, uh, that's, very, that's correct. Uh, whoever had done it and brought, brought uh, the body here had collected the stones and placed them on the body. In your experience, this is pretty unique. Well, yes, it's unique in that uh, in Derbyshire, it's the only one I ever came across in my time. It was a, a, a country location and a body hidden by stones. But there's some very interesting and unique features in relation to this murder and to this as a deposition site. I mean, I know there are walkers around today, but you've got to go back to 1994. Her body would be deposited here late at night. It's an isolated spot. He would undoubtedly need to have a car. The fact that she was buried under stones meant that he took time. He wasn't simply rushing this. So we've got a very calculated and determined killer on our hands. It was also interesting that Peter referred to the fact that there was no other forensic evidence at the crime scene. I mean, that to me is quite significant in relation to Griffiths, because Griffiths, of course, um, is very careful about the kinds of forensic evidence that's going to be found that can tie him into crimes. But I'm still not decided. I'm still not decided because this is 1994, and we've got a big gap, therefore, in terms of uh, Griffith's development as a killer and whether he would be that forensically aware, that calculating in 1994, as opposed to in 2008, 2009. This crime was committed a long time ago, with no witnesses. At this stage of my journey, there doesn't seem to be enough evidence to link it to a young Stephen Griffiths. So I'm going to move my criminological investigation forward by concentrating on his killing cycle. By working backwards from where it ended, I want to see if I can discover where it started. One of the most shocking elements about Griffiths' final known crimes was that he claimed to have eaten parts of his victims. If, in fact, he did so, then perhaps it was just to further his desire for notoriety. I've come to meet Dr. David Holmes, an expert in psychology, to uncover what this depraved act can tell us about Griffiths. Cannibalism is actually intended 
to be the taboo for a reason. I, I think buried in there perhaps with the, the way that we used to practice cannibalism, it's in situations of desperation and also in situations of complete dominance and conquest of another person. You can't go further in controlling somebody than eating them. So David, where do you think this cannibalism fits in into the, the development of Griffiths as a, a serial killer? I think cannibalism would always have been on the agenda. I don't think he actually predetermined exactly when he was going to do this, but definitely um, there was a progression in, in aggression to others, in the denigration of others, in which I think cannibalism was reaching the peak. Holding up his hand, implying that there are five murders as opposed to the three murders he's been convicted of. Should we interpret those other two murders as exaggeration? Um, I think he probably was responsible for other killings. The idea that there could have been five is very likely. The fact that he retracted and went to three from five is probably a case of him controlling information and realising that maybe, as in the case of Brady, if you hold some information back, it gives you some kind of power, control over your captors. By his conviction in 2010, it's clear Griffiths was practised at controlling and dominating his victims. But to link him to a cold case, I need to uncover exactly when this behaviour began. To get a deeper insight, I've uncovered a series of voicemails he left his ex-partner after their relationship had ended, to see if they can shed any light on what he was capable of at the time. You have 18 If anyone can provide me with a picture of his state of mind at this time, it's the former partner herself, Kathy Hancock. He was very, very good at picking up things that you're possibly insecure about. He would get into your head, mm -hmm. but in a very passive way. This idea of him trying to get into your head, was this as a, a way of controlling your behaviour? I didn't know at the time, but yes. How long did your relationship with him last? Probably only six months. So you had split up by what, July, August 2001? Yeah, yeah. Just so that I can get a picture of him and his psychology, did, did he beat you? Yeah, did he... yes. Uh, could you describe some of those incidents? Oh, um, well, he's tried to overdose me on drugs, he's broken my nose, he's stabbed me in the legs got cuts up my arms, my legs, scars. Did you report these beatings? No, I couldn't get away from him. Mm -hmm. I wasn't allowed. So this is abusive, controlling, aggressive man. I did... fell pregnant to him, so... Mm -hmm. uh, did, uh, did the pregnancy go to term? No, ectopic. I see. How did you recover from losing your child? To be honest, it was kind of a godsend. Mm -hmm. I'd have been stuck with him for life. How did he react to that child being lost? The pregnancy test kits, he, he had me prove that I was pregnant, so he had the pregnancy test kit and he kept one that was positive and he actually made a coffin for it. How did that strike you? Strange, really strange, because I can understand somebody being upset, but it wasn't being upset, it was... His behaviour was really odd. The revelation that Griffiths was so distraught at the loss of their child in 2001 is compelling, especially as the second cold case on my list also took place that year. To establish a potential criminological connection, I've sought the opinion of Dr. Sam Lundrigan, an expert in the geographic behaviour of serial killers. She's produced some empirical evidence relating to Griffiths and my second cold case. Geographical profiling involves mapping where crimes occur and analysing their pattern in relation to a suspect's daily routine. It can help prove whether the offender is responsible. It was most famously used by the police 
in trying to apprehend Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper. Sam, can you explain to me what we've got on this map? This is a map of Yorkshire, David, and what it does is illustrate those locations by the green diamonds that we know Griffiths was familiar with. So it ranges from where he was born right the way through to where he went to school, where he's lived in various locations, through to the red light districts he frequented daily habitual activities. And you've got a hypothesis about the relationship between everyday locations and criminal locations. Absolutely. Criminological research has shown that there is a very important relationship between where an offender lives and where he commits his crimes. Mapping unsolved murders of sex workers in the north of England between 1991 and 2010, then removing the three cases I believe Griffiths could not have committed, I'm looking for geographical links to the two remaining cold cases. The next slide shows the murder of Dawn Shields in Sheffield. So if we were to hypothesise that Griffiths was responsible for this murder, then we'd have to look very closely at how we can link him to Mam Tor. I wonder if we could have a look at the, the geographic clustering in relation to the Dance of World War Lucas. Yeah, that's much clearer, isn't it? You've got a complete overlap there between um, Griffith's world, if you like, and the location where Rebecca Hall's body was found. Is one stronger for you than the other in relation to Griffiths might be the perpetrator? I think if we look at them and we look at their similarities, on the face of it, it might suggest that they would be linked. But actually, if you look at the geographical um, proximity, I'd hypothesise that the Thornton Street one may be more compelling. The geographical analysis in the second cold case suggests similarities to Griffiths' known M.O., Access to victims and the opportunity to kill them are the two most important factors for a serial killer. This analysis makes me think I may be able to link Griffiths to this case. I've discovered that one of the cold cases I've been investigating bears similarities to the modus operandi of convicted serial killer Stephen Griffiths. Geographical analysis places the unsolved murder in close proximity to the area where Griffiths was known to operate. So I want to look more closely at this case. 19-year-old sex worker Rebecca Hall disappeared from Bradford's red light district in April 2001. Two weeks later, her body was found. She'd been battered to death. To this day, no one has ever been convicted of her murder. The second case that Sophie asked me to consider was the murder of 19-year-old Rebecca Hall whose body is found here in this car park in April 2001. And there was also some indication that she may have been held somewhere before her body was deposited here. Now, unlike the Don Shields case, where Don's body is found in a very rural location, Rebecca's body is found at the heart of Bradford's red light district. And crucially for me, Stephen Griffiths lived only 800 meters away down this hill. It was here that the body of 19-year-old Rebecca Hall was found. Now, Rebecca was also a sex worker. Her body had been stripped, and it's presumed that she had been battered to death. There's no forensic evidence that the police can use to either rule Stephen Griffiths in or out. But for me, from a criminological perspective, there are a couple of issues I think that we have to consider. This is a killer, it seems to me, who's developing. And of course, there's no forensic evidence on the body. That's quite significant. That implies some forensic awareness. But above all, if we think about the importance of geography, if we think about the importance of home to serial killers and how serial killers will often start to kill very close to where they live, well, Stephen Griffiths lives only half a mile that way. 
Rebecca's also been murdered at a time when Griffiths's personal life is disintegrating with Kathy Hancock. So whilst the police might not be able to do anything with the Rebecca Hall murder, criminologically, I think this is worth pursuing. Rebecca Hall's murder taking place within just 800 metres of the home of a known serial killer who claims to have killed more women than he was convicted of is too coincidental to be ignored. This case has all the hallmarks of Griffiths' M.O. and coupled with the geographical analysis of his crimes, I believe this justifies further investigation. Without any physical evidence linking him to the victim, the police were unable to pursue matters further. But I uncovered one final compelling fact that would seem to suggest a link between Rebecca Hall and Stephen Griffiths. Part of the problem about connecting Griffiths to these cold cases has been it's been impossible to build up a personal profile of Griffiths himself. He's the classic loner, and therefore I haven't really encountered anybody who knew him for any distinct period of time. Now, that makes it very difficult to build up this picture of who Griffiths was, but I've managed to track down somebody who knew him not just for a few months or a year, but somebody who knew him for over 20 years. So I've come to interview Bridget Farrell to see if she can help me throw some more light onto these cold cases. Did you know Rebecca Hall? Very well. Tell me about Rebecca Hall. I went to school with her from middle school. She was my sister's best mate. And so she, she was murdered when she was 19. Did yeah. you know her from school days all yeah. the way through? Yeah. Apart from there were a gap because my sister was murdered and I stayed at the scene for about a year or so. And when I came back, she'd started drugs and started prostitution. Did Rebecca Hall ever go into Homefield Court? Yeah, 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 yeah. Did Rebecca Hall know Stephen Griffiths? Yeah, she did. She used to smoke in his flat with me and other girls. So this is, he knows her quite well then? He knows a lot of us, yeah. But you presumably gave witness testimony to the police about yeah. him knowing Rebecca Hall? Yeah. Well, all of us did. I can't say that they didn't know Rebecca Hall went there, because they did know it's on CCTV. You can't get any better evidence, can you, than a camera. So Rebecca Hall can be placed in Homefield Court? Definitely, 100%. Stephen, Stephen Griffiths is in Homefield 100%. Court? 100%. Her body's found 800 metres away from Homefield if that, Court? If that, if love. Discovering that a convicted serial killer knew a victim who visited his home and was murdered just metres from where he lived is a significant lead that shouldn't be ignored. But are there any other facts that could further connect Griffiths to this unsolved murder? I asked the person who was actually in a relationship with him in 2001, his former partner, Kathy Hancock. One of my students gave me a list of some unsolved murders. I just wondered if you've ever had either of the names Don Shields or Rebecca Hall. I have a Rebecca Hall. Well, what, what can you tell me about Rebecca Hall? I'd heard of Rebecca Hall because basically at the time of her death, he took me to where her body was found mm -hmm. and showed me over the wall. What did he say when he took you to that? He said, this is where that young, that prostitute was found. What was he trying to do by showing you that? I don't know if he was trying to scare me mm -hmm. or if he couldn't keep things in, I don't know. But he was excited. It just so happens to be around the corner from where he lives. Mm -hmm. And at the back of it is his um, doctors and the pharmacy that he goes to. My investigation into the sequence of murders committed by Stephen Griffiths has focused a great deal on geography, especially the geography of Bradford and the red light area of the city where Griffiths lived in Holmfield Court. We also know definitively that he killed three sex workers for which he was convicted in 2010. But did that killing cycle begin earlier? If we look at Griffiths' M.O. from a criminological perspective, several key aspects such as victim selection, access and opportunity, and crucially, geography again, reappear 
in the Rebecca Hall case. The fact that Griffiths knew Rebecca and even took one of his ex-partners to go and see where Rebecca's body had been found are, for me, facts which are hard to ignore. Now, I'm not a police officer, but for me, these links between Griffiths and Rebecca are so clear that I think they justify the police looking closely at Griffiths as a suspect in Rebecca's murder. Well, and Professor Wilson will continue this new series at the same time next week on Channel 5. Next tonight, there's more shocking real-life footage with Britain's worst serial killers.